Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission here is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Today is a a fun episode with one of our very own team members, Lucas Ward. He's our senior app developer, and he's been a guest on the podcast a couple of times before. Today, we're going to dive into a couple of different topics. Um, We're going to be talking a little bit about the book, The Messy Middle, and how we can translate app development and some processes within the app development world to the business world as well and to operations and actual implementing those things into your business. Uh, Plus, at the end of the episode, he's going to tell you about a really cool new product that uh, he's been working on and is going to be able to share a beta version with you. Uh, So be sure to stick around for that. We're going to have a wonderful chat with him coming up next. So grab a cup of coffee and join us for the conversation. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make. We're sipping on lattes, and it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh yeah! All right, welcome, Lucas. Thank you very much for taking time out of your I don't know, busy, What's happening? busy day. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Coffee Break podcast? Uh, probably not. Oh, well, I'm glad that, uh, glad you could be here today. Lucas is one of our team members, senior app developer, um, under our newly generated lab division of LockDuck security. We're going to be talking about some really cool stuff today from, uh, it's not, I, I, I guess I was thinking through this and hopefully I didn't le- lead you astray from our prep talk, but Try to talk less about the technology side of it, but more about the process side of it. So I don't want people to, I don't want people to jump on here and go, Hey, this is going to be a, a geek talk. Right. So deep dive on the technical stuff. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we do that, it's rapid fire, five randomly selected questions just to get to know, un, uh, get, to, uh, get under your skin. That's, that's what we'll go with. Are you ready? No. <laughs> Have, this is the first episode that you've been in the new studio, right? I, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, this for, is for the, the, the third new studio, so I mean... That's very true. All right, fair enough. All right, here we go. Ready? Yes. Question number one. What small gesture from a stranger made a big impact on you? I've got one. Um, what small gesture from a stranger made a big impact on you? This is not... We've, we've gone through this, Lucas. Okay, next question. <laughs> no, I'm... Uh, let's see here. Um, wow, that's a tough one. Uh, from a stranger? Mm-hmm. I, uh, man, I probably shouldn't use this example, but, um, I once tried to buy a a cigarette from a homeless man and he decided to just give it to me, even though he probably could have used the money. So I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. And, um, you know, but just in that moment, I was made a big impact on you. Sure. Well, I mean, it's what's coming to my mind right now. So, uh, I, when I asked the question, I said, (laughs) I'm hopefully this doesn't include a Lucy and it did. (laughs) If you would have just answered the question, we wouldn't be having this conversation. All right, question number two. What kind of things are normal now, but will be highly valued antiques a century later? Ooh, oh, I think smartphones, as amazing as they are now, are eventually going to be replaced with brain technology interfaces. Wow. That's so, kind of deep. Know, they'd be like, what? You used to hold your phone in your hand? Yeah. People well, couldn't ring into your brain? But to, to value that, I mean, what? A BlackBerry. I've got one sitting on a ca- uh, on a shelf somewhere as an antique. Is you have to plug it into a wall to use it? <laughs> Do you prefer summer or winter activities? Ooh, summer for sure. I uh, I'm not a. I like to look at the snow and maybe go uh, you know walk around a little bit. Yeah. But that's pretty much the extent of it. Summer activities for sure. What particular summer activities do you enjoy? Uh, swimming, uh, diving, jumping. Diving. You're a professional diver. Well, yes. Oh, fun fact. I see. This is this is why we do this. I've never. I can make very little splash when I dive into the water, and apparently that's a that's a good dive. I don't know. Hmm. Next question. This is question number four. Ironic. What quirks do you have? Uh, I tend to talk about my cats when I get nervous or anxious, so uh, that's a, a tad bit quirky. Okay. Um, I like to make random sounds, uh, just off the cuff, you know, you can hear me for miles. So, uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, yeah, let's just leave it at that. 
<laughs> cats and, and random sounds. <laughs> Those are enough quirks to, to, to dive into for a while. <laughs> Last question, number five. What's the most annoying thing about the social media platform that you use most often? Um, so I really hate how on Instagram, mm-hmm. because that's the one I, I most frequent, um, you may like pull up your feed and see two or three posts and then uh, get a call. And when you go back to your feed, it automatically loads in new posts and all the posts that you hadn't uh-huh. seen are, are just gone and you have to go scrolling or yeah. digging around to find them. And then, you know, your fiance is like, why didn't you like my picture? And it's like, well, it's Instagram's fault. And wow. So anything else we need to unpack? There? <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> oh man, any, any I've other, said too much already. Any, any other issues that we need? No, uh, it's it's interesting because when Instagram first launched, it was very chronological. Yes, and then when they started changing the algorithm to sell more ads, it became well. You know, Facebook it, bought Instagram and ruined it. So uh, all right, <clears throat> we won't go down that path. There you go. Five random questions you passed. That's called rapid fire. Your score. 812. I demand a rescore. <laughs> oh, I demand. Okay. That's S- not seven, good. 740. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. You asked for it, and they're finally here. We are so excited to offer free educational classes to our customers at our new expanded facility. With a range of classes to choose from and new classes being added monthly, you can learn on a variety of topics, including understanding your Brevo system, tips on managing security for your facility, and information on how to navigate video footage with Eagle Eye. All classes include lunch on site and unlimited coffee. Schedule a class today by visiting lockdoc.net slash class. Uh, Today is going to be a fun conversation. Um, And and we've had a couple of these, but this is what, your third, fourth uh, Who's counting? Episode? I don't know. You've it's been, my fourth episode. Oh. <laughs> you've been on here quite a few times, but today I want to do a little different uh, conversation because it's been really cool over the past, let's just say six months, sure. uh, to see how the app development department has turned into a department and it's actually like really getting some, I'll say getting some traction and some clarity in vision. If totally. that makes any sense. It, it makes perfect sense, actually. Um, since, since bringing on Aaron, our uh, junior app developer, um, things have started to, to move very quickly. And, and just, just by kind of having somebody that I, I have to be, be somewhat responsible for has, has made me um, be more responsible to myself and to my own daily tasks because, you know, I, I don't want to be slacking off or whatever. And, sure. and uh, you know, I try to lead by example. And, uh with her kind of feeling in some of my um, areas that I was lacking in skill set has allowed us to take on um, different projects, uh, much bigger projects with more ambition and more scope. And um, so that's, that's pretty much uh, the long and short of it. So to kind of set the table a little bit, um, our, our, our organization here, LockDoc Security, um, brought on an app developer, which is yourself, Lucas, uh, it's, uh, October of 2018, 2017. Exactly. And, um, with the whole scope of rebuilding our workflow management software, our dispatch software, basically the stuff that runs our entire organization. And through that process, it's been a huge learning curve for all of us involved with it. Um, and it's been really cool to see the, the, the transition along the, the timelines at a point, uh, we were able to see some major opportunity to be able to share that piece of software that uh, I've been working on for a many number of years, but in its current state, to be able to share that version of it with other companies similar to ours um, in the service industry. And through that process, we have both learned a lot, and I know you specifically have learned a lot through that. And so I wanted to kind of dive into the the education process and learning uh, along the way. At a point, a couple about a year ago, I think I uh, I had had a book suggested to me called The Messy Middle, and I was listening to it while I was jogging, and uh, I I started listening to it because my understanding of the book was that it was all about the journey of small business and learning the the middle part of the small business when 
things aren't really that great and you have you don't have that victory story yet like this was what happened and it's not like the early starting phase where you're trying to figure it all out it's that messy middle well as i was reading through the book it was all about app development and the process of launching a a software product uh and so at that point we kind of chatted about it and now you have uh, been reading that book and so i want to kind of talk through that part because the interesting component of it is you can really uh, divulge the topic of the app development product side and just really talk about the business development phase and they're, they, they are very applicable to each other. They, they complement each other very well. So um, if, if no one has ever read the book or they're not familiar with it, kind of give, give us your synopsis of, of what The Messy Middle has meant to you and how you've been able to apply that or, uh, or I guess align yourself with that through your learning process. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll start by saying that um, reading the book uh, definitely as a de- developer sort of turned my world upside down, especially as a, a developer with, you know, less experience and not too much tenure in the field. And so, um, you know, we, we invested a lot of time into building our workflow management system here at LockDoc and uh, through that process of trying to resell that and create that and, um, kind of put it out there for the rest of the world, uh, I began to realize even before reading the book that, hey, you know, building a product for your own company versus selling it on a large scale is two very different things. Um, There's many, many other components to be considered. And so um, through reading the book, though, and and sort of educating myself on, well, this is the parts you need to focus on, and these are the the failures and the shortcomings. And the the whole time I'm like, oh my gosh, I've done this. I've done that. All these things that I've been doing wrong. And uh, It was kind of this uh, surreal moment of wishing I had read the book before I had ever began. Yeah. And, you know, of course, your hindsight is a a 2020 there. But, um, yeah, so so to dive into some parts of that, um, really the the biggest struggle and uh, one of the reasons we've we've sort of had to pivot kind of our plan more recently is um, the crafting the first mile, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and the, the book very clearly explains it, it kind of builds a picture of your average user. And, um, and you can apply this to yourself too. You know, if you think about when you install an app or uh, download a piece of software, um, if it's not extremely intuitive and easy to use right out the gate, mm-hmm. you're probably going to spend five minutes on it, get frustrated and go to something else. And yeah. so that's, that's the whole process of crafting the first mile is how do you capture your user? How do you get them to intuitively use the design you've created? And how do you create that design? And um, one of the, the key aspects of that is to just always be improving that. Even after you have tons and tons of users, you want to continually be crafting that uh, first mile. And then, um, and so, so it's a bit... But I don't, I don't mean to catch you off track there, but I, you said a couple of interesting things there. I want to I unpack a little more. One, pivoting. Yes, and, and the adaptability to pivot, and two, the the first mile in app development or in user implementation uh, for for an app is one thing, but the first mile is applicable to any business. Like you can say the first mile is the process when a customer walks into a restaurant. Can they easily figure out the menu and Absolutely. easily go through that process? Yeah, if you if you walk into a restaurant and there's not a a sign that says "Please seat yourself" and there's no uh, um, host there or hostess, then you're going to be kind of like, uh, what's going on here? And you may even leave. And uh, yep. that's, it's the same in software and business and, and kind of just in, in anything that a user can experience. And it doesn't have to be in the technological world. It can be in the physical world or yeah. in, in really anything that somebody is going to experience. There's the uh, concept of the first mile. Well, I've seen it too, even like on our website, finding ways to make that easier for people to navigate our website. We did a redesign a couple of years ago, but it's a constant tweak of, all right, when a, when someone that's never dealt with our business before comes onto our website, do they intuitively know what they're supposed to do? Like we know because like we live in it every day, but if a customer doesn't know intuitively how to process that, then it's, it's a complicated thing. And most of the time they're just going to give up. And so the book associates the first mile with, if you don't get engagement in that first mile, then you're, you're going to give up. Yeah. You have to gear it to very easily frustrated, impatient people, because that's, that's the average user that in, in, in this day and in age, people expect a certain catered experience in business or in app development or, uh, in, in websites. And, um, if, if they're used to, you know, 
if they're used to having their eyes directed directly to where they need to click by colors and lines, and then your app doesn't do that, um, people aren't going to take the time to just read the page. If you just put it on the page and assume someone's going to find it, then you've already messed up. Can you copy this key? That's a question we get asked about 3,422 times a year. And how can you actually be sure that the person who asked that question is supposed to get a copy of that key? Well, we think you should always know who can copy your keys to your business and your home because it could be your neighbor, an old employee, a contractor, or even worse, your mother-in-law. At LockDock Security, we believe in protected key systems, so you always know who has a copy of your key. To find out more, visit LockDock.net or stop by our Charlotte location. LockDock Security, helping you protect your people and your property. So I'll, I, I, I'll, I use the restaurant analogy, so I'll, I'll kind of tie it in for this. Have you been to the Cheesecake Factory before? Of course. Okay. So you have the Cheesecake Factory menu, which is a book. Meatloaf. You eat meatloaf at the Cheesecake Factory? Yeah, you get three big slabs of meatloaf, and it's, it's delicious. It's the best meatloaf. There's a, another restaurant here in town uh, called uh, Bossy Beulah's, I think. I could have butchered that name. Their menu consists of a chicken sandwich. Or a chicken sandwich with cheese. That's so, keeping it simple. <laughs> when you walk up to order, are you going to get the chicken sandwich? Or are you going to get the chicken sandwich with cheese? Well, their whole process is very simplified, but there's really no confusion when you go into order. That's your options. You can make a quick decision. And if you don't like chicken, then you don't want to go to that restaurant, obviously, because it's, it's, it doesn't work. But that, it's an easy first mile. It's easy to get in there and navigate. If you go to uh, to uh, the Cheesecake Factory, you sit down oh, and you, you get a whole there. book. Yeah, you you have to read all kinds of things and make decisions. So it could be a it, it's a turn off for me to go to the Cheesecake Factory just because it's an overwhelming choice. That's why I just get meatloaf. Meat yeah. You know, I, I see the menu and I'm like, well, so you've gotten past the first mile, you <laughs> yes. chose meatloaf, and now you're done. Yeah, I uh, I've flipped through the uh, the three ring binder that they give you as a menu and. Uh, consistently found the meatloaf. So. so as service companies, how are we also applying that? That's, that's the kind of challenge. The question is, how are you applying that same first mile philosophy? Is it complicated for people to, to get service from you, to figure out how to navigate whatever it is that you're asking them to navigate? And then if not, how are you pivoting? So that's the second thing that you were talking about that I wanted to, to, to do a little deeper dive in is what has been the, the lessons that you've learned through understanding how to pivot or why pivoting is important? So when it comes to pivoting, um, most, most cases when you're, when you're about to pivot, it's either from somewhere on high and upper management or whatever is, you know, you've been told to pivot or um, you've gone down some path to do something and you've failed and now it's time to look at other options. And so the, you know, fa failing fast is a, a huge thing they talk about in the messy middle and, and in other resources too. It's, um, you know, the, the sooner you can put a prototype out there or a beta version or run, run your uh, new service scheduling process by some potential customers. Sure. And the sooner they can tell you that it sucks, then very quickly you can pivot and try something else. And yeah. so, you know, that obviously plays right into your agile uh, methodologies and schemes and uh, gives you the ability to um, kind of just, you know, change change it maybe your goal changes mm -hmm. um, maybe the way that you're presenting your data or your your web page or your service changes um it doesn't have to be a, a full pivot you know it's not like oh you're you're building um this one app that is for the restaurant industry and you fail and you say well you know i'm gonna go work on automotive apps now you know sure. it may be a slight pivot or maybe it is a big pivot yeah so w when it comes to that what are some of the things that you've learned through uh all right been working very hard down this particular path. And now I've had this realization that this is not going to work. I've got to change. What, what would you say to somebody that's maybe working in their business or working on something and they've really gone down this path and they're like, this is, we've put all of our, all, all of our hope in this. And we're starting to have the realization that this is probably not going to work out. What, so what do we need to shift? It's, it's really counterintuitive to human nature to want to, throw away something you spent time on. And in the messy middle, they refer to this as killing your darlings. Um, and I really like this, uh, this way of saying it because nobody wants to kill something that is darling to them, Sure, but, um, it can be necessary to pivot. So, um, if you've, if you've invested time and resources, um, the best way to, to kind of 
mentally attack something like that of, you know, trashing your work is to chalk it up to a learning experience, find the positive, the silver lining and learn from your mistakes so that when you make that pivot, um, you know, you'll over time through pivoting multiple times, you'll, you'll learn, uh, warning signs and red flags. Like maybe you want to design some very specific thing that your mobile phone can do. And it turns out to be a research project in the field that, Mm -hmm. you know, companies are already dumping millions of dollars in R and D is like, well, what are you going to be able to do in that situation? You know? Sure. Um, and then you may find that, uh, it's very easy to create this, but because of that reason, everyone else has already done it and they've been doing it and they've been doing it better. So, yeah. um, it, it all aligns back to figuring out your, your niche and what you can do good and keeping it simple and, and just iterating on that until you've got the best product. So another thing that I've, I've seen happen um, over the, the last couple of years is the understanding that there's, a, there's an objective, there's something that you're trying to figure out, but through the process, you have a realization, I don't quite have all the pieces of the puzzle just yet. Oh, yeah. So that's the, you have your known unknowns and then your unknown unknowns. And so, you know, you can, you can postulate uh, as to what your unknown unknowns are all day long, but you know, as soon as you know what they are, then they become known unknowns. So the uh, unknown unknowns are those things that you have no conception of that are going to keep you up at night and they're going to come and they're going to bite you in the tail. And, mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes it's just like, oh, I, I didn't realize that users would click this button before that one. And so let's just change the CSS and it's fine, no problem. And then other times it's like, oh, I didn't realize that we needed this whole scaling plan in order to replicate our application across the country, you know? And, sure. and so it's these, these you know, through that same process of, of sort of learning from your mistakes, maybe the unknown unknown came crashing in and, and totally ruined your week and uh, you had to pivot really fast and put out a bunch of fires or maybe you were doing some reading and some prior planning. Yeah. And um, therefore you kind of discovered these things by chance. And so, uh, you know, that, that prior planning really does prevent poor performance across any, any realm, really. Well, the, the, I think the interesting component that you 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 haven't quite got to yet from that that topic is the fact that a lot of times I've seen through development that there's an end goal that we're trying to figure out and you could be just h- kind of hitting your wet, your head against a brick wall not making any progress you stop and work on something else and in the process of working on something else completely different unrelated to that project that you're trying to solve a key piece is uncovered that solves the the problem over here, you know? Absolutely. I, I want to take a second, uh, and this may not be totally relevant to the business world, but in development, you have something called a, a tool belt or a utility box. And, and as you, you learn different design patterns and elements of design and mm-hmm. development, um, once you've sort of implemented this feature here, there, or there, it's been added to your toolbox. And so, you know, whether that's discovering unknown unknowns that apply to a different project or, you know, um, temporarily pivoting away from something to give your subconscious time to process what you can't figure out or just mm-hmm. giving your brain, you're giving yourself a rest because you don't want to burn out and you have to pace yourself, obviously. But um, those, uh, excuse me, those unknown unknowns will, you know, ultimately lead to learning experiences that you don't have to ever experience again if you're intentional about, you know, getting the full benefit from them. So when, when you discover this thing that has, you know, caused you grief and uh, you've tackled it, um, don't stop short because it may be that there's more to that unknown unknown that you didn't know. <laughs> sure. So with, within that, one of the things that I've seen happen um, it, with, with your department in particular has been an underlying goal for the past couple of years to develop one specific app. And, and it, this app is very specific to our industry, but it generates key systems, master key systems. And while people are, are listening to this or watching this, they're like, hey, okay, there's tons of pieces of software out there that generate master key systems. There's very few that do some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. And at the very onset, early onset, it was how do we get to this point? How do we get to this end conclusion where this particular app, application that you're trying to develop has all of these components? And until recently, all of those, those pieces, those tools in your utility belt and your toolbox weren't quite there. Totally. And so through different learning experiences, you have understood how to 
develop that process? It, it's also taken some um, um, humility in that, you know, I, I, I love learning. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you could shut me in a room for 10 years and I'll learn everything and, and build the whole thing by myself. But that's, that's not how things work in the business world. And so kind of drawing your lines like in the sand saying, okay, like I, I could take the time to learn these things and, and apply it. But I, I realized that spreading myself thin and, and doing too many things, I won't do any of them good. And mm. so hiring Aaron, a junior app developer, bring her on the team has allowed me to really, really focus on the portion of the development that I understand and know well mm. and leave to her the parts that I, I don't understand. And, um, you know, you've said it time and time again on the podcast, you know, uh, hiring people that are smarter than you in their area to do things that you can't do and then letting them do it. It's, yeah. uh, it's tough, you know, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely been a learning experience. Well, in, in the big part of that too is the collaboration. So, and we've talked about this before where I think there's a couple of different levels and I, I've seen this very keenly in, in, your, in your office, uh, which is not very far from where we're sitting right now, but you previously worked through a lot of stuff independently. So you had a lot of stuff in your head. You also had your own notebook and you were working through a lot of information. Now that you have a, a second person on your team and sometimes working with a third person, you have to be more visual. You have to be more communicative. You have to get those ideas out of just your head and what you understand. And what I've seen that to be the case is it makes you think through the process on a different level. Yeah, there's, there's really two parts to that. Um, the first part is when you put you know, passionate people together that are passionate about a project or a technology, um, the discussion should come natural and uh, should be riveting, you know, because I love talking about technology and, sure. and you know, a coworker loves talking about technology. And then the, uh, the second part of that is, um, you know, when you're, when you're on your own, you're, you're kind of just pulling from your own body of knowledge, guessing as to what best practices are and, and um, you know, the best way to do something. And you don't really, you know, unless, unless you have some type of community on the internet or mentors or things that you can bounce people, bounce ideas off of. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't have very many of these things. Um, I was in the restaurant business for 10 years before I started as app developer. And so I, I was largely missing that piece. And having someone there to just sort of, uh, I, I guess the term is, is rubber ducking to, um, you really just. I'm going to Google that real quick. What is rubber so, ducking? So mean? rubber ducking is, you know, you're, you're trying to program something and you've hit a wall. And the idea is you have a rubber duck on your desk and you start telling the rubber duck about the problem. And just through talking it out, hmm. you know, you may realize something. And so um, rubber ducking with an actual person is uh, literally a hundred times better because you may not have to talk it out. They may know the answer. Um, not even so 15 you minutes. you talk to inanimate objects on your desk is that what you're saying? All the time. Oh. Um, yeah. I have a rubber dragon duck uh, that, <laughs> yeah. No, but not, not even 15 minutes sure. ago, I um, am trying to upload an image onto a web form and, and send it to the back end. And I'm like, what is going on here? I, I can't figure this out. I, I don't do front end stuff. And I spent about five minutes on it. I'm like, well, let me ask Erin. And so she lives in the front end world and is like, oh, it's just this thing right here. Blah, blah, boom, done. Now, now previously I may have spent a week trying to figure this out. And she told me in five minutes, you know, oh, it's easily accomplished by doing this. And the, and the same goes vice versa. And so, sure. you know, she, she's an awesome rubber duck. She talks back. You just refer to her. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We need to get some rubber ducks in here, okay? I, whatever works for you. I, but it, it's very interesting because I've seen that in play and I've seen it in, in actuality. And the progress that you've made in a shorter period of time, because you have that collaboration effort, you have that ability to rubber duck off of each other and make progress is really cool. But even the part of just getting it in a visual form so that you all understand, you know, what is the progress and this is where we are. I mean, you know, you were showing me some of the stuff on the wall that you're kind of going through. You've got little post-it notes and it's just a very visual process. Maybe not a lot different than what you were doing before independently, but because you have to share that information with someone else, it puts it in a different form. And now you've seen progress at a faster pace. Yeah. Vi- visual aids are indispensable. Whiteboards, uh, post-it notes, all those things. Um, especially when you work in the abstract, you know, you're, you're writing code and the code that you're writing doesn't necessarily lend to exactly what it's doing. There, there's no visual there. Yeah. Um, you will, you know, on the front end, there's, there's some visual, but for the most part, you kind of have to build your own constructs as to how you understand these things. And, yeah. and the same can be applied 
anywhere. And, and what I've what I've found is since going down this path of of development is that I'll be explaining just everyday basic concepts like, hey, this is the best way to load the dishwasher. And uh, if it, you know, this is a bad example. Um, but just just having having visual aids to to better communicate an idea is is always a positive thing because um, you have visual learners, audio sure. learners. Um, so you argue about the best way to load a dishwasher. <sighs> well, that sounds like a conversation you've no. had with Levi. <laughs> no, get out of here. <laughs> nope. Uh, I just hand wash everything because who needs a dishwasher? <laughs> just a reminder: you're listening to the Coffee Break podcast. Also. We wanted to let you know that our team puts together a weekly blog post. You can find it at locdoc.net slash blog. It's guaranteed to raise your IQ by 12 points or your money back. So it's pretty much a win-win. All right, back to the conversation. You're working on several different projects simultaneously right now. Yes. Um, and and to to dis, to talk about a, 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 bit, a bit ago, you mentioned, um, yep. you know, stopping what you're doing and focusing on something else. So for some people, that means taking a break, um, you know, going for a walk. Uh, for me, I tend to stop what I'm doing and just work on a different project and a different technology stack for a different purpose. And I, I've found that, you know, just taking a mental break, even if you're still mentally doing something on the forefront, will mm -hmm. give your subconscious time to work through some of the difficulties you, you may have been having. No, and uh, this is very true. So thinking through that, I, I'm trying to process that on the business world. You're, you might be trying to solve something in your business and all of a sudden you just kind of become frustrated and you're spending so much time that you can't solve it. Maybe just put it on pause and go work on something different that you know you can make progress on. And just even that mental break is yeah, a, is a, a huge Yeah, get thing. a good night's sleep. And um, I can't tell me how many times I've woke up in the morning and a solution was just waiting for me upon waking up. And it's like, oh. I, I really just needed to uh, to shut down for a second and and to allow sure. some some processing to go on in the background and uh, you know that that definitely applies to any issue you're struggling with. So you're working on several different products and projects right now. Um, one of them is the the key system generator that I kind of referred to earlier, and I'm trying to I'm trying to approach this in a state of um, of uh, being very generic with it because I don't want it to be tied too directly to, you know, what it is that we do specifically, right. but also like just the process in general. So what are some of the things that you've learned through bringing a idea and a concept to life? Well, the, um, the first, the first thing that I learned is that you can't skimp on gathering your requirements. You know, um, mm. if you don't have a, a clear conception of uh, what the idea is, what the end product is, yep. then you don't really have a starting point. And so um, I, I would say a, a good first step in, in any project, um, business or development is to really get together with the person that you're building the product for, learn everything that you can learn, um, spend some time watching, uh, research other products, and just information gathering, knowledge gathering, researching. Um, and once you have a good grasp on what the real problem is that people are struggling with, because mm -hmm. um, someone may come to you and say, hey, you know, I, I want this uh, new text editor that has this functionality. And it turns out that really the problem they were having is that the text editor they're currently using doesn't support the font that they love. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, if you can find out what hmm. that one struggle bus is, then, you know, you can, you can ride that thing all day long. That's very interesting. We, I, I'm trying to stay on topic here, but we've had multiple issues in our own business where people are saying, hey, you need to redesign this entire thing or redevelop this entire thing because it doesn't do this. And ultimately it's, some other issue that it lended to yeah, what just the information wasn't being displayed where it needed to be. And it's a, it's an easy fix. So information gathering priority, number one, making sure, Hey, I've I, I kind of got a good grasp on what I'm trying to accomplish here. And all, a lot of the variables that are associated with it, knowing that I'm not going to be able to get all of them uh, or that I'm not going to be able to gather all of them, but I want to be mindful as, as many as possible. Yeah. And I think the second part of that is um, having the right tool for the right job. And this is definitely something that is more generic and, and can apply to the business world. Um, you know, if, if you're going at a, uh, a Phillips head screw with a hammer, then you, you've, you've, you've missed it somehow, you know, you, you've really messed up. It and works. So, you just have to hit it really hard. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it works to some extent. Sure. Um, but you know, if, if you're trying to design 
a website mm-hmm. and your technology stack is for designing video games, then what the heck are you doing, right? So having having the right tools in place for the uh, the right job and also um, having the right people to use those tools, you know, um, and, and again, that, that research and learning portion is all part of uh, finding the right tool. Sure. You don't want to set out on a course um, using the wrong tools and having the wrong people using those tools. So a, a big component of a lot of the things that we talk about, especially within the development world, is, is kind of, it's speed like, and being agile, being able to get it out, fast to fail, all of those things. And it's been really cool to see this concept for the last couple of years being a concept. And then once you were able to gather the information and kind of get the right people on to the project, then the speed uh, to bring it into life has been amazing. It's been very short once you kind of got to the point of, all right, we've prepared, we're ready with as much that we know, and now let's go. Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, even even if you do extensive planning, um, one, once you go to execute, there's always going to be those unknown unknowns that we mentioned before. And, uh, sure. you know, the scope of your problem may change. But I think that um, getting to that point to where you're ready to start can be kind of difficult because you you don't you want to make sure you do enough planning. But yeah. you don't know how much planning is required because maybe it's a new venture. And so um, once your planning phase is complete and you've started, maybe you have to go back to the planning phase. And this mm-hmm. is something that I did many times with the Master Key System Generator is I was like, well, let's try to build it using this technology. And I was like, no, this is not going to work. It's not mm-hmm. secure. Uh, let's try to use it building this technology. And so, no, 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 I don't know enough about this technology. Let's not do that. And so back to picking the right tool, using what's already in your tool belt to get started and then, you know, building on that. And really, you know, from, from an outside perspective, it's like, oh, this, this app came together so quick and out of nowhere. But it was actually like the third or fourth iteration on the back end. Yeah. And then, um, you know, Erin Aaron came and did her thing on the front end and it was like suddenly very visually pleasing instead of this horrible thing that I had cobbled together. But, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a real process and it's a journey. And um, I think in, in the business world, you know, if, if you're starting a business or you're trying to grow your business, uh, there's going to be missteps and uh, there's, you know, maybe you have a bad hire or maybe you thought some process was great and it turns out that it, you know, was missing pieces. But uh, you just iterate from there and you you move on. And uh, if you don't have those feedback loops built in to where you are kind of constantly reassessing your current situation, then you won't have a great eye on that. So it, it's important to, um, you know, do your research get your prototype going, show it to people. Yeah. And, and again, this isn't st- strictly to development. Your prototype may be a process that you're pushing through your employees. Yep. And, um, and once it's gone to, to get feedback and to actually listen to the feedback, um, it, it can be hard to say no yeah. sometimes. And I, you know, I've struggled with this. Um, that's what we have 50,000 features in our app, but um, it, it can be hard to say no, but uh, just dis- having some method by which you can disseminate that information and pick out kind of the gems like, oh, you know, all these people, they're saying these random things that at the end of the day, they'll get over. Yeah. But everyone has said this one thing that's consistent. We're going to change sure. that because that's a, that's a big failure point. So another interesting component is the A-B testing. Yes. Um, and when I was kind of reading through that part of the book, I was like, okay, that's really cool. That makes sense. All right, we can do that. Like, on a, you know, on our website or maybe through the app or whatever. And then it really kind of came to life when we said, well, let's A, B process, uh, A, B test processes in our business. Yeah, so it's create very two cool. separate people, sets of people, and let's give this one group, this particular process for whatever it is. And then this group of people, this process and see what the difference in it's, the outcome is. It's especially beneficial for processes that could have potential, you know, make big waves. Yeah. Right. So, um, instead of saying, all right, everybody, here's a new process, let's do it. And then that's when you find out that it's not good. And you is, recoil. That, yeah, and, and yeah, we, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so be, being able to take two or three people off your team and put them in the new process, get feedback and maybe even change the process before adding more people to it mm-hmm. just lends to that agile, that iterative approach and, um, having, having a, a means by which you can accomplish this. Right. So, um, for us, it was our, our workflow management system built on track via mm-hmm. it is very quick and easy to change. It's, you can do many, many experimental things very easily. 
And, um, you know, maybe, maybe other apps and things don't have that same flexibility, but that's not to say that your business and your employees don't. Yep. Um, so, you know, your, your process change could literally just be a policy change that you roll out to a few people and, uh, they, you know, say, okay, instead of showing up at seven o'clock, I'm now going to show up at seven 30 and take a 30 minute lunch and see if my productivity has increased. And most people are going to tell you that sucks and they want their hour lunch back. But uh, then you have time to pivot and you didn't ruin sure. everyone's day, just a few people's day. Hey, thanks for listening to the Coffee Break Podcast. If this information has been helpful to you or you just really kind of like our theme song, can you help us out by rating us on whatever app you're using? And if you get really fancy, how about sharing a screenshot on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn? Okay, enough of all this. Let's get back to the conversation. No, and it's very true because you could do that on the way that you answer the phone, the the tri- type of emails that you're sending. Like, there's all kinds of ways that you can do that. You're just testing it with a few select people or a few select customers, seeing what the results are, fixing it in that small confined uh, group of people, and before you apply it to the whole, and then realize, oh wow, I've made a really bad mistake. And also being open to their feedback, um, knowing that the solution you're trying to provide may actually be worse than the current solution. Sure. And so, you know, if, if you, if you react negatively to people's feedback, then you're, you're not going to have a good system. You're not gonna have a good feedback loop. So you really want to encourage your feedback and, uh, and iterate as quick as possible. All right. So we talked about, um, we talked about, uh, getting started uh, in any kind of going through the messy middle process, but the first mile, any type of first mile, first impression type thing that you're dealing with a customer or a, a user. Uh, you've got the, uh, the, the process of killing your darlings, not being too tied to something, being true to your mission, being true to uh, the vision that you're trying to accomplish, but not being too connected to small little intricacies that may not be a bad, uh, may not be a great solution or a great fit. Uh, we talked about uh, A-B testing trying to figure out how you can test different processes and implement different processes and being able to pivot easily. Uh, What is the kind of the next process? So now you have this thing, you've gone through all this and now I've got this, this thing, what am I going to do with it? I I would say at this point in time, um, you may be feeling some fatigue. Yeah. And so you want to be extra careful, not, not to burn out at this point and, and to, to play it safe and to be patient. Um, If you, if you've rolled out a new process, and you've gotten verification that it is indeed a better process, but maybe there's some grumbling about it. Yeah. Um, maybe you have some, some older team members that are stuck in their ways or um, in the development world, maybe you have some people that are really still just using their old apps. Um, you really got to have the patience to stick it out. If you quit too soon, if you give up too soon, then you'll never really meet that mark. You'll never really make that progress. And mm. uh, it's, it can be tough because yeah. um, sometimes it feels like uh, the odds are very stacked against you. And, um, you know, it's just really sticking to that vision and not, you know, there, there may be minor tweaks you make to your goal or your vision, yeah. but, um, really sticking to that one goal, you know, you, something you can run similar to, to core values, you know, filter, you can run everything through. If, if it's something that's taken 90% of your development time or 90% of your, your time, uh, changing processes that really has very little impact and, you know, is holding you up, then maybe you cut it. Maybe you don't, maybe you stick it out and just knowing when to, to make those decisions and, and how to kind of get through some of the the mental pain that may be associated with that, you know, killing your darlings is never easy. Yeah. All right. So there's a, a lot of things to unpack there. There's a lot of things to work through. The book is really great, totally. beneficial thing to to read if you're in the app development world or if you're just in business development as a whole. It can open up your eyes to some other processes. Uh, so with all that, you do have uh, a, a one of the products that you've been working on, and you have now the ability to kind of get that user feedback. Yeah. So, um, we recently launched a beta and by the time you listen to this podcast, which is being recorded live, uh, you, you'll be able to access that beta at, um, beta.lockdocinc.com. And, um, if you're not in the locksmith and security industry, you may be totally lost as to what this app is supposed to do. But uh, if you want to check it out anyway, and just make sure the page loads, then, uh, you know, you can do that. And the, uh, there'll be a submit feedback button on there and some disclaimers about, you know, don't put any private information in there because it's a public beta. Yeah. But um, definitely check it out and we would really appreciate your feedback. So it's it's an opportunity to say, hey, okay, this is something I've, I've seen it come to life. I'm going to be able to give some input, impact, some feedback, and then um, have that as a final, a final 
usable product as as we can as we move down the road a couple of months probably closer to the summertime right and that's uh that's your user acceptance testing and if that part flops then it's it's back to the drawing board so it's a crucial final uh, stroke there in the process well and it's it's something again in the business side of things if it's you've got to this point all right we've done all of this homework we've come up with this product or this solution and now we're going to launch it out and see if customers actually want to use it now is the time to test it. And if it doesn't, then you have the still have the ability to pivot, but right. um, you're going to be able to get some real-world feedback. So yep. cool. All right, so beta.locdocinc.com. Yep, it's one of your spare domains you have just hanging around there. So uh, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just We just got them under the table here. <laughs> yeah, well, what, yeah, else, what else you got them. There? Lucas, thank you very much. Uh, it's been very interesting chatting with you and then watching your learning experience over the, the last couple of years, but even so just even the last couple of months to see that progress being made and, uh, and, and the development, um, just, just coming to life so quickly and so fast and the experiences that you've been learning. So very, very cool there. Thank you. It's an exciting time to, to work at LockDoc and, um, I'm just, you know, super uh, pleased to be a part of the team. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Lucas, thank you very much for joining us today. It, uh, it's always a blast to sit and chat with you. and glad you could join us in the, the new fancy studio. Hey, uh, by the way, if you haven't already, be sure to check out lockdoc.net slash podcast. You can subscribe there uh, to any of the pl- podcast platforms. So if you're watching the video version of this and you want to be subscribed to, see the, uh, to hear the audio version every week, make sure you go there and check that out. All of the icons are listed. You can click there, subscribe, uh, and we'll have a new episode every week. Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time that you'll be able to tune into for all kinds of business ideas, practices, and strategies. If you're listening to the audio version of this and you've already subscribed, thank you very much. If you're on iTunes, if you could give us a five-star rating, that would be great. It'll help get the word out to other people. If you have uh, not seen the video version and you'd be interested in that, well, you can check that out as well. It's at lockdoc.net slash podcast, or you can search us on Facebook or YouTube Just search L-O-C-D-O-C and you'll see a slew of videos there to check out. As always, thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Coffee Break Podcast.